Welcome everybody to today's webinar series. I think we can get going. I think we've allowed enough time for everybody to join. This webinar is proudly brought to you by SAFMED and SAFMED, as you know, has been your solutions partner for the last 30 years, hopefully both in the CCD and the operating theatre setting. This webinar series is all about sterility assurance and we're hosting these every two weeks, giving everybody a little bit of time in between so that we can get on with our work and manage our current circumstances, which in South Africa, as we know, are pretty tricky. In webinar one, we focused on sterility assurance. What is sterility assurance? And we began to understand the concept and the process of sterility assurance. Today, being webinar two, we're going to look at the role of sterility assurance in the prevention of surgical site infections. In webinars three and in webinar four, we'll look more at the items and the consumables and the types of things that we can use to monitor our steam sterilization or all types of sterilization. And webinar three will be hosted on the 21st of July at the same time again. So thank you kindly for joining us today. I'm going to start by recapping what we learned in webinar one, and I've taken four pertinent points out of that webinar. You may have thought that there were other more important pertinent points, but these are the ones that, that stood out for me. Number one, it is the responsibility of the CSSD manager to ensure every medical device that leaves the unit is safe to use on a human. Number two, we need to validate each step of the decontamination process, including sterilization of devices. Number three, validation of device uh, sterilization is a complex process and it incorporates a number of steps and procedures. And very important, all staff must be trained in the checks that are needed to be made before a sterilized device can be used. Very simple, very logical, very important processes and very important steps. What I want to cover today, so firstly we're going to take a, a, a bit more of an in-depth look at the World Health Organization guidelines for the prevention of surgical site infections. We touched, we touched, we briefly touched on them in webinar one, but we'll go into a bit more detail in webinar two today, of course. Then after that, there are one, two, three, four, five, I think it's five published papers that focus specifically around sterilization um, or, or things that have gone wrong during sterilization and the importance thereof and, of course, how they relate to surgical site infections. So I think it's five or so published papers that we'll take an in-depth look in. So that's what we're planning to cover today. The whole idea, of course, is we are focusing on sterility assurance and we're focusing on surgical site infections and how we can prevent them. The World Health Organization Global Guidelines for the Prevention of Surgical Site Infections was uh, released or published in 2016, so it is a little while ago. Uh, the aim of this guideline is to provide a comprehensive range of evidence-based, note, evidence-based recommendations to prevent surgical site infections. And um, in the executive summary, it notes the following things, that many factors in the patient's journey through surgery have, um, have been identified as being contributing factors to the risk of surgical site infections. And surgical site infections are the most surveyed, most frequent type of healthcare associated infections in low and middle income countries. Of course, South Africa falls in that category. And surgical site infections can affect up to one third of patients having undergone surgical procedures. Incredible. So it's quite a comprehensive document. It's 186 pages. Uh, I must admit, for this webinar, I managed just to focus on our section, so I didn't have to review all 106, uh, 186 pages in that much depth, but I'm very sure many of our infection prevention colleagues have. So I focused on this section, section 3.3. And section 3.3, as you can see, covers the importance of a clean environment in the operating room and the decontamination of medical devices and surgical instruments. So the environment or the operating room environment could be an entire webinar series on its own, I'm sure. And we did touch on that a little bit in some of our previous webinars. But of course, today we'll focus in that guideline on the decontamination of medical devices and surgical instruments. As you can imagine, it's um, 
a lot of it is like a succinct version of, of the CSSD guidelines that the World Health Organization has already released. Uh, of course, it covers the basics and the essentials of decontamination, um, the, the reprocessing cycle, we all know quite well. It covers Spalding's classification, which I know you know well and we touched on last week, of course. It talks about the facility itself, the design, a little bit about the design and the flow, all of the aspects we know well goes into a bit more detail about methods of decontamination, a bit more detail about validation. That's what we spoke a lot about last week. It also goes into detail about immediate use steam sterilization, loan sets, obviously those are topical issues. Then it moves on to more of a, a theater oriented user perspective, talking about user sterility checks talking about the use of instruments in the operating room, the role of the floor person, the role of the scrub person, the role of the surgical team, and it also finishes off with focusing on endoscope. So that's basically an overview of what's covered in that chapter. So I'm going to be talking about some of the aspects um, within the guideline that, that resonated with me and I thought were particularly interesting. We know that both patient-related factors and procedural fact factors can influence a patient's chance of developing a surgical site infection. Now, in the guidelines, they, they, they seem to divide between low- and middle-income countries and then, you know, international or European and the Americas. So, of course, our focus on the lower middle-income countries being relevant to us. And in there, um, it states that the incidence of surgical site infection, the rate tends to be higher for procedures related to oncology, to orthopedics, to general surgery, and to pediatrics. Um, those are the percentages that, that popped out to be the highest. I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, the pediatric one surprised me quite a lot. Also, the high rates of surgical site infections following cesarean, and section, uh, cesarean sections, and of course that they were much higher when compared to that of Europe. It's a very good question. I'm not too sure why that is, but let's delve into some more detail. Maybe we can figure that out. Around about the same time, they released an infographic. I'm quite a friend, or I like an infographic. I think they, they normally contain nice, succinct bits of information, and they're normally visual and colorful, and, and I seem to respond well to those kind of, that kind of information. The page one of the infographic talks about stopping infections um, after surgery. What's the problem? Let's identify the problem. And it divides it into two sides, one being high income countries and the other the low and middle. On the high income uh, side of things, they speak about in Europe that surgical site infections affect more than 500,000 people in a given year and that can cost more than 19 billion euro. I can't even calculate that in rand cents. And that around 1% of people that have surgery in the US develop surgical site infections, and that can cost the Americans about what, over 10 billion uh, US dollars per year. That's incredible. That's really, really sad. In low and middle income countries, they, they speak about more than one in 10. One in 10 people who have surgery in low and middle income um, countries can get surgical site infection. One in 10, wow. And that the risk is three times higher in a, in a low um, and middle income country versus a European or a high income country to develop a wind infection. And one in five women in Africa who deliver their babies via cesarean section are bound to get a wind infection. Wow, that is very sad and, and phenomenal statistics. On page two of the infographic, they go on to talk about what is the solution, and they divide the solutions into before surgery, during surgery, and after surgery. So before surgery, all the important factors like bathing and showering and the whole thing around saving, shaving, um, use of antibiotics, correct skin prep, um, correct scrub technique, and um, washing hands, etc. During surgery, they talk about limiting the number of people in the operating room, we spoke about that last in our previous webinar series and limiting the number of door openings, again, a, a critical issue. And then, of course, they go on to talk about ensuring that the medical devices and instruments are sterile. That's what we're here to talk about today, isn't it?
I remind you again, the World Health Guideline clearly states that it's the duty of the sterile services manager or the person in charge of the sterile services department to ensure that a medical device does not leave the unit unless it is completely safe to be used on a human. I remind you of that again. We spoke about this last week, and it's a very important point. Outbreak of infection that was relating to an Accusa device, and we realized that what had happened and what caused the outbreak was a change in a whole series of processes, including the cleaning. You know already that if a device is not cleaned properly, it won't be properly sterilized. We know that we have to reduce the amount of bio burden, the amount of microorganisms on a device during the cleaning phase. And if there's bio burden or there's biofilm, the sterilant won't be able to penetrate and we won't get a thoroughly or properly cleaned uh, sterilized device. In fact, high level disinfection will also not work uh, or the disinfectant won't work effectively either, now will it? We do know that. But let's take a look at the sterilization process itself. Let's delve a little bit deeper into that. And this uh, article published by Dancer in the American Journal of Infection in um, of hospital, oh, wrong one, Journal of Hospital Infection um, in 2012 is really quite interesting. Uh, Dancer is out of Glasgow and presented this at uh, one of the World Health uh, Forum for Sterile Supplies Congresses as well. So an outbreak began in this hospital in Glasgow and uh, the investigation process was led by Dr. Dancer and the team of microbiologists. The outbreak of surgical site infections um, began with 15 orthopedic patients and five um, ophthalmology type uh, patients. Being microbiologists, they start first by having a look at the patient's um, specimens because they wanted to understand the causative of microorganisms. And that, of course, could help you to understand where to look uh, because it depends on the type of, of microorganism that's, that's uh, um, in the wound itself. Then they started to look at commonalities. Uh, what about the surgeries were common? Were, they, were the patients nursed in the same ward? Were they nursed by the same staff? Did they undergo similar procedure types? Uh, were the patients' uh, surgeries conducted in the same operating theater? Obviously, the surgeons are going to be different. Um, is it the same theater staff? Is it the same room? Is it the same anesthetist? They went to the ward and they reviewed the ward practices. They reviewed hard hand, gene and hand hygiene processes. And they moved off to the operating room and then reviewed some of those practices as well. And while they were interviewing the operating room staff, the staff said, you know, of late we've noticed that we're getting a lot of damp packs. And the packs are either damped and they're stained. Some are, some aren't, but we've noticed a, an increase in that. So as you can imagine, that alerted the, the microbiologists and they went off to the CCSD and began additional inf uh, investigation in the CCSD environment. When they were there, they noted a few things. And the first thing that they noted was there was a distinct lack of hand wash facilities and certainly nothing near the autoclave areas. They noticed that staff didn't wear gloves when they were unloading the autoclaves or the sterilizers. They noticed quite a few damp and stained instrument trays. And also what, what was quite interesting was the wrap wasn't torn. The chemical indicator on the outside had passed, but the sets themselves were damp and they were stained. Not all of them, but a good percentage of them. So they specifically identified 20 sets and using a sterile technique, they unwrapped the sets and they swabbed the inner lining of the wrap and they swabbed the instruments themselves. These were the findings. So of those 20 sets, I've highlighted all the ones in yellow. If you look down the bottom left, um, one to 20, ones highlighted, were all positive for microorganisms. So on the instruments themselves, that was positive for microorganisms. In two of the instances as well, the wrapping was positive for microorganisms. Now the inside of the wrap, not the outside, the inside of the wrap. As you can see over here, um, set number one, it was damp and discolored and positive for microorganisms on the wrap and on the instruments. Set number five, damp but no discoloration, positive 
set number six, damp and discolored, positive. Set number seven was dry, no discoloration, yet there were still microorganisms on the instruments, and so, so it goes on. So in some instances, the sets were dry, the sets weren't damp, they weren't discolored, yet they were still positive for, for microorganisms. Interesting scenario. So after much debate, much assessment of the system and understanding the microorganisms themselves, they had to come to the following conclusions. The first point was that there must have been something faulty in the autoclave process leading to the wet packs. And that faulty could have been the machine itself, the autoclave itself. It could have been the quality of the steam, or perhaps the steam was too wet. It could have been how the autoclave had been loaded. It could have been how the autoclave had been unloaded. But obviously, uh, processes or uh, things that had gone wrong leading to wet packs, per se. And then also noting, because of the nature of the microorganisms or the causative microorganisms, that they were, that they were microorganisms normally found on the skin. And the conclusion was that there was an ingress of, um, of microorganisms from the skin and the environment during handling. So now I ask myself, why in goodness name were these packs released from the CCSD? Why did the CCSD manager allow damp, discolored packs to leave the CCSD? And even worse, why on earth did the operating room staff decide to use these packs that were damp and discolored? I think that's very scary. Was that because they had no other inventory? Was that because they had no other toys? But surely somebody would have been reporting this. Surely, hopefully, somewhere in the monitoring processes, somehow or another, we should have picked up earlier that something was wrong. Did they do all of the monitoring that was required? That wasn't discussed in this particular published paper. So that's a good question. Did they do their biodic test? Were they able to pick up on the, on the quality of the steam? Quite fascinating. Then I think to myself, but hang on a minute, when I'm auditing a CCSD processes and I've been in the field, what have I seen? Hmm. Okay, have a look at some of these pictures. So these are various auditing uh, pictures or pictures from various institutions in the South African setting taken myself. So these are all things I've seen. On the left-hand side is an autoclave rack. Why in goodness name is the rack looking like that? That appeared to be corroded. So something's wrong with the process. Why did we not pick that up? The packs on the top middle and the right hand side of the um, of this uh, slide, the torn pack, the stained pack, the discolored pack, those two packs I saw on a trolley outside the theatre about to be used on a patient, ready for the list. Of course, poor handling, as you can see, the lady using the towel to try to get the pack out with, and then the Con the color and, and state of that filter from that container. Surely, to goodness, that'll alert you to the fact that something is wrong with your steam sterilization process. I would have hoped so. So what can we do? What can we do? Here's another paper from O'Hara, uh, this time the American Journal of Infection Control, where they looked at reprocessing in low and middle income countries. That's the title, as you can see. In this particular instance, they asked surgeons from the Institute of Global Orthopedics and Trauma to participate in this research. I'm not too sure of whether the surgeons themselves were the ones who did the research or captured the data, but I'm sure they would have allocated it, but they were the ones who, who then uh, submitted. Seven out of the nine countries that were approached agreed to participate in the research. They asked the institutions to test autoclave cycles using chemical indicators that they provided. And the same cycles that they put the chemical indicator into, they wanted them to document the time, uh, the cycle time, the exposure, temperature, and the pressure maintained during the cycle. Nine of the 26 sites that were targeted in the seven uh, countries responded, and a total of 90 sterilization cycles were actually then tested. Right, 78% of the sites obtained acceptable readings in all 10 of the chemical indicators 
that were performed in the tests that were performed. So that was pretty good or relatively high. One would have hoped for 100%, but it was 78%. But interestingly, when they reviewed the cycle parameters, because remember they documented the cycle parameters, in all 90 tests, they had at least one variable of time, temperature, or pressure that was not within the required sterilization parameter. It's quite fascinating. By the way, the chemical indicator that was used was a type 5 chemical indicator, which of course behaves more similarly to a biological indicator. In our webinar next week, on, between uh, webinar 3 and webinar 4, we'll discuss in more detail the difference between the various types of uh, chemical indicators, how they work, what they pick up, um, and, and how, how we can use them best in our setting, all as part of our validation process. And you might then be able to understand why it's possible to have the chemical indicator type fives all pass, yet there are some issues with, um, with some of the parameters. But we'll look at that more deeply, as I say, in a future webinar. Looking at um, some of the details in amongst that research now, so it was nine hospitals, so yes, hospital one to five. Uh, taking a look at the frequency of testing at the hospitals varied, um, which was quite interesting. Uh, the, in some instances, it was daily, others monthly, others not at all. And types of testing ranged between, in this group, pretty well only chemical indicators were used for their test methods. And then hospitals six, seven, eight, and nine. It was quite interesting as well. Again, monthly, weekly, daily, monthly. Um, and what I was quite interested to hear was some used visual inspection, and I'm not sure what visual inspection means. Uh, I'm not sure if that was just looking at, at uh, the printout or just looking at, at what the packs themselves. I'm not 100% sure. Now, if you want to ensure that your devices are safe to use on patients before they leave your department, you are going to need trained or knowledgeable staff, and you're certainly going to need the right resources and capabilities. And those resources firstly include trained and um, knowledgeable staff, as well as equipment um, uh, and all the consumables, etc., that we need to be able to uh, test our sterilization monitoring or monitor our sterilization processes. So now we're going to take a look at two more papers, also out of low and middle income countries, around sterilization and around knowledge. So paper number one is out of Ethiopia, and paper number two by Fast et al., as you can see, uh, looks at the Republic of Congo, Madagascar, and Benin. Paper number one was looking at the knowledge of healthcare workers around um, the CSSD practices and sterile services practices. The people that were interviewed were nurses, doctors, and laboratory technicians. As you can see, 68% were nurses, 18% were physicians, and they worked in a variety of departments, including outpatients departments, triage, emergency rooms, delivery rooms, dressing rooms, and minor operating rooms, laboratories, etc. They posed a series of questions to the healthcare workers. There were 328 respondents, so 328 people responded. Only 40% of them had ever heard of Spalding's classification. At least 58% uh, of them knew that decontamination was the first step in the process. 97% of them, thank goodness, knew that sterilization kills microorganisms, including spores. And um, only 67% of them knew that steam sterilization is the preferred method for reusable surgical instruments, obviously the ones that can go through steam sterilization. And that's quite an important and an alarming statistic for me because that helps me understand why it is we take shortcuts and why we soak things when perhaps we should be sterilizing them. What would be really, really interesting of all of these questions posed of all the research that I'm, that I'm alluding to today, it would be really interesting to see what the outcome would be if we repeated that in the South African setting. That's why I think it's really important that all nurses, not just nurses living, living working in the CSD environment, are well versed in SSD practice. So um, quite a few of our colleges often have me lecture for them um, to the students, and we do that quite early in the process, and I think that's really critical. 
going to the, the paper from FAST down, looking at resource um, and, and capabilities, looking at some of these hospitals, as you can see on the top column over there, um, Republic of Congo, Madagascar, hospitals and health centers have responded. How many facilities had warm water easily available? Well, none of them. How many facilities had various sized cleaning brushes and sponges available for cleaning? None of them. Based on my experience in many South African hospitals, I would agree they also don't have all the right resources. They also don't have all the brushes or the sponges that they need. How many facilities had appropriate detergent? None of them. Again, in my opinion, many of our hospitals have the right detergents, but they don't use them correctly. They, um, they don't dilute them correctly. They under dilute often, or they mix chemistries, which I find absolutely fascinating. Or in some cases, for whatever reason, we decide to use hand-based soaps, like a heavy scrub, for example, to wash instruments with these special laryngoscope blades, which for me is really a, a very sad, terrible practice that we have to, we have to get under control. Number of formerly trained workers doing sterile processing. Well, look at that. That's very sad. Very few. Number of facilities with restricted entry to, to uh, sterilizing areas. One. Again, another thing I'd like to know about how that happens in South Africa. I'm sure it's really not great. And then uh, number of floor model autoclaves found to be uh, functioning. Well, not that many either. In conclusion, it's not easy to ensure that every medical device that leaves the unit is completely safe to use on a human. If a device is not properly sterilized, it can and will transmit microorganisms. That's it. It's simple. We have to do everything in our power to try and prevent surgical site infections. And one of the ways of doing that is making sure we monitor our sterilization processes. We need sterility assurance. So in webinar three and webinar four, we'll do a detailed review of the consumables that we can use to monitor steam sterilization. And if there's time, other types of sterilization as well. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, as normal, we will be sending you a link to the survey and a few questions. If you'd like a certificate of attendance, you will need to have to answer the test questions. Thank you kindly. Hope you enjoyed today.